Hello, I'm not, I'm not having any audio. Everybody is having audio? No, I'm not, I'm hear not hearing. I'm not hearing anything either. I'm just hearing now. Okay, okay. Hello? I'm not, I'm not. Yes, hearing now. Okay. Hello. Yes, we're having audio. No, I'm not hearing. Can everyone hear me now? Yes? You're just okay. hearing you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for a um, road safety lunch hour talk. Um, I believe so far this is this is our final and this is our final talk for this month in the series. And so far we have spoken about uh, children and and, the, and road safety. We've spoken about young and deadly drivers, and we've had road um, post crash care. So this morning's topic, this afternoon's topic, is on motorcycle safety. Right. So we know that motorcycle fatalities is high in Jamaica, like most fatalities, but particularly motorcycle fatalities have been high in Jamaica, and it is the government's priority to focus on this and even. Um, implement uh, implement strategies and implement strategies that will curb these accidents and fatalities um, over the last decade 2020 alone recorded the highest number of fatalities and we recognize that this multiple that there are multiple factors that contribute to the increase um, we've also seen the rise of commercial use of motorcycles along with pre-existing conditions such as lack of training and improper um, certification and law enforcement challenges. There are a myriad of problems that we are faced with that we really have to address. And it requires a joined up approach and we all have to play our part to mitigate against that. So today we are joined by um, a number of stakeholders, including of course our own Ms. Deidre Hudson, Hudson Sinclair, um, Mr. Kenius here, the director of the Island Traffic Authority, Mrs. Paula Fletcher, the executive director of the National Road Safety Council and uh, um, ACP Gary McKenzie, the assistant commissioner of police in the Jamaica Constabulary Force. We are hoping to later hear from a motorcycle crash survivor. And uh, as we get into it, I, I, I believe we'll all get some insight and I expect to learn a lot. So I hope you can come along and learn a lot with us too those who have the knowledge share it those who don't be ready to, to learn something new today um we will start off with uh, um a prior like we usually do and if you just prepare yourselves um let us pray most righteous heavenly father as we come before you this afternoon we give you thanks for granting us another day another opportunity to make a difference in in our island we ask that you guide us that you guide these proceedings that we are able to come together put our heads together and transform jamaica's road safety culture lord we ask that you take full control as we proceed and the efforts that we put out today will not go in vain. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, so our first speaker is Mrs. Sinclair, the director for the road safety unit. Ms. Sinclair will be speaking on motorcycle fatalities and understanding the numbers of that. So Ms. Sinclair, if you may. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate the panel taking the time from their busy schedules to join us to discuss, you know, this issue of motorcycle safety. Now I'm gonna take a moment to share my screen so we can have an idea of, you know, what's really happening in motorcycle, in, to motorcyclists right now in our country. So I'm gonna start with the first slide. And what we're looking at is motorcycle safety, motorcycle fatalities from 2019 to 2021. Now, in summary, let me just narrow this screen. 2021, 
was a deadly year for motorcyclists. We recorded the highest number of fatalities this year, 39% over the period June, from 2019 to 2021 as at June 20th. So in a comparable period up to June 20th for the period of 2019 to 2021, 2021, we had over 39% of motorcycle fatalities. Now, unfortunately, this year is also significant because we recorded the first female rider motorcycle fatality over that period from 2020 from 2019 to 2021. So while this pre was predominantly uh, seemed to be a male activity, but we know that female riders, we, we've always had female riders. There have been female casualties, casualties before, but we had us, we, in 2015, 2016, we weren't seeing any of these casualties. 2019, nothing, 2020, nothing. But unfortunately, for, you know, we had our first female fatality and it was a young woman and it was rather unfortunate. She was 22 years old and her life didn't have to end this way and it's totally avoidable. Now, 14% of fatal motorcycle crashes for 2021 20, occurred during the times of curfew. Now, you know, it's difficult, We, you know, it's difficult for the police to be out and about. They're dealing with crime, they're dealing with theft, they're dealing with a lot of things and, you know, for motorcyclists, you know, to disobey the law in that way, put themselves at risk, you know, it's it's rather unfortunate, but, you know, this is the true reality of what we're facing. And the police have made lots of efforts and great striving, trying to, you know, appeal to motorcyclists, trying to get them off the road when they're doing curfew hours. We've seen the pictures on TV with the parties going on, and, you know, that motorcyclists and motorcyclists, PMC passengers and drivers are a part of it, you know, where they think that it's necessary for them to go out and be on curfew hours. Now, the Western parishes, Westmoreland, St. James, St. Elizabeth, Hanover, and Trelawney account for almost half of motorcycle fate crashes, 48% to be exact. For the period of 20 crashes, for the period of 2019 to 2021. And, you know, it's, it's truly... It's, it's an area that I'm sure ACP McKenzie will talk to you about the specific roads that we're observing that, you know, we, we know we're having major problems with the East, within these parishes. Now, the top, top six main causes of these fatalities were attributed to failing to keep to the near side or poor, well, basically failing to keep proper traffic lanes. You know, we're going outside of our lanes and that could be attributed not only to behavior, but road markings and a lack thereof. We have the issue of excessive speeding without no regard to conditions. You know, these are two wheelers. They don't have trash cages. You know, the only thing that motorcyclists have to help themselves is a helmet. And if they're riding in, you know, conditions where it's wet, if there's gravel on the road, the scenarios are endless where, you know, a two wheeler can really lose control. Now, turning right without due care was another factor. Overtaking improperly on the inside is another issue. Failing to comply with traffic signs and signals, as well as following too closely behind another vehicle. Now, we have a graph, and this graph has a very scary trajectory. From 2010, so fatalities for the period of 2010 from 2010 to 2020. This is 10 years. And we started at 39. We grew one to 40. And you know, this is a growth we really don't want to see. We've hit double digits to triple digits and then continued. We had one dip in 2018, but then, you know, by 30%, we added another in, in 2019. And now for 2020, we trended up and we have obviously surpassed that because as we record, we, as we stated earlier, we have hit the highest number of fatalities in 2021. So just to highlight the fact that we have over a, the highest number, 140 in 2020, 15, 15%. Years 2019, 2015, 2018, 
accounted for 14%, 12%, 11% of motorcycle fatalities, respectively. Now, as of June 20th, for the years 2019 to 21, we said that we recorded the highest number at 70, 79 fatalities, representing 39%. While 2020, we recorded the lowest number. And now this could be attributed to a lot of things. We were under heavy curfew. We had COVID out and about a lot of, we had a lot of different things that you know, affected economic activity. We didn't start the bike tax, well, we didn't start the bike delivery services as much. We were just getting into that. And now we're seeing that, you know, we are in COVID, we've gotten used to the whole thing. We're getting tired of being locked inside. So now, you know, it's like we're bust out. And it's unfortunate, it's like a, you know, a sore that we've actually bust out into, and it's very, very unfortunate, you know? So we recognize that overall for the three-year periods, months April, May, and May, we recorded the highest number of fatalities at 20% each. Following that, months of January, February recorded 18% each for motorcycle fatalities. So we're, and, you know, we'd probably have to look up what is happening in April and May was the time when we started having we were lowering our curfews. These are things that we'd have to look at to see what motorcyclist behavior, what it was affected by. Now, we're looking at motorcycle fatalities by age group and gender. So ages 34 and under accounted for 61% of all motorcyclist fatalities as of June 20th. So under 30 or work, 34, a working population, the people who will be taking us into the future, we're losing them. And of that number, of that 61%, the age group of 20 to 24 recorded the highest number at 23%. Following that were the age groups of 25 to 29 at 15%, 30 to 34, 12%. And unfortunately, we are teenagers are now becoming victims. Bikes are accessible, bikes are cool, it's freedom. 15 to 19 at 11%. So we know they're not having a license to ride any at all. We know that most persons ride you know, on their learners, but we're having an age group that has in access. They wouldn't even have the ability to go and get a learner you know, if they're under 18, but yet they're being exposed to this type of behavior. Now, approximately 5% of the fatalities we weren't able to identify. And the other 5% was, it, was in the age group of 65 and older. All right, I'm gonna go to my next slide. All right, it was a little bit of technical glitch, but I think I got it, yes. So we were, this is motorcycle fatalities by time. We were alluding to the fact earlier that curfew, we seem to have a lot of fatalities during curfew hours and at least 55% of motorcycle fatalities occurred during the hours of 2 p.m. to midnight. So not necessarily curfew, curfew time, but we recognize once we hit that over nine o'clock, it's just recently we got changed to 11 p.m. But all this period we were by eight, nine and seven, once we hit that six o'clock time, we knew we were in curfew zone. So over that period, we, of that period, 55%, so 2021 recorded the highest at 21%. 14% of motorcycle fatalities occurred in 2021 during curfew hours. On the other hand, 2020 recorded the lowest at 55% um, at 16 so we know that maybe because curfew just started, it's something that, you know, we were in the height of paranoia at some point in time in terms of not wanting to be sick. We may have taken precaution, but, you know, obviously, I don't know, my grandmother says sometimes when you have a bull in a pen too long, it breaks out. So, you know, we are realizing we are beginning to lose the battle when it comes to motorcycle fatalities. Now, as we discussed before, top five main causes for fatal motorcycle fatalities during the period of 2019 to 2021, as at June 20th, were attributed to failing to keep the near side or proper traffic lane. Once again, we, we reiterate that, yes, there are some, some of it has to do with driver behavior, but some of it 
we as stakeholders have to bear, bear the responsibility in terms of upkeep and maintenance of road safety features of signs, markings, things like that. And we are going to have to hold ourselves accountable for that. Proceeding at excessive speed without, without um, no regard for conditions. Once again, is it training that we're looking at? Is it that you know, we do not recognize how to judge the situation, the conditions that we're in, and how to adjust for that? Turning without due care and improperly overtaking on the inside and failing to comply with traffic signals. Western parishes, Westmoreland, Trelawney, St. James, St. Elizabeth, Hanover have been known hotspots for motorcycle parishes for over the period. For the period 2019 to 21, as at June 20th, these parishes accounted for 48% of motorcycle fatalities. The six parishes that recorded the highest number were Westmoreland at 20%, St. Andrew and St. Elizabeth, each at 11%, Clarendon at 10%, and St. Catherine at 9%, St. James at 8%. So please keep in mind, we're looking for the period of 2019 to 2021. But if we were to take a snapshot at 2021, we really don't see it as high in St. Andrew, but mostly coming over to the Western parishes. Now, recommendations. Some of these recommendations are things that road safety count, um, we've had already in play by our different stakeholders the Road Safety Unit, the National Road Safety Council, the police, the public safety and traffic enforcement branch, other players that we have, like the Gasoline Retailers Association. You know, this, net, this network for road safety is not only government based, but we have a lot of commercial entities, business organizations like the IAJ, the communities, you know, even the communities so where a crash is happens frequently have gone on and played a role in trying to see how they can stem the tide of motorcycle fatalities. Now, some of it, we targeted outreach program for riders. The communication is centered around how to operate motorcycles safely, um, riding in adverse conditions, training for those things, and then also looking at the cost and the physical impact of injury and loss of life. When I met someone who, I've, I've actually had friends who've been in motorcycle crashes, and when they describe what a cherry is, trust me, and healing from that and having not able, you can't scratch it or itch it or, you know, and then the burning, it's not, it's not wonderful, but yet you, you see your friends go through it, but you know, we haven't been able to, to link, you know, some of the hurt that people face in terms of injuries and even the loss of life. You know, how do we convey that in a better way so people understand the ramifications of what is happening out there? All right, so another issue is identifying motorcycle crash hotspots. Identify roadways that has a significant motorcycle crash, sorry, incidents of motorcycle crashes. And also after recognizing these roads, we cannot foot the blame totally on road road user behavior. We also have to look at well, audits, road safety audits and inspections, because we do recognize there may be things and features in the roadway that attribute, that contribute, and may be a serious factor in why motorcyclists have crashes on our roads. A targeted helmet campaign, boy, I remember when I was at Road Safety Unit, you know, we used to stand up with a team at Halfway Tree before bike delivery was that popular. You had companies who had bearers, and I could tell you for businesses, a lot of the companies, they don't have a bike guy. Some of the businesses that definitely demanded that their rider had a motorcycle, a motorcycle had a helmet. However, they were just the regular guys who were using motorcycles as, you know, their go to their personal mobile you know, motor vehicle to get to from place to place. And, you know, it was sad that persons really did not conform to motorcycles, no matter how much we preach about the protection it offers, which is, by the way, a limited protection because yes, at certain speeds, it's not gonna help you. And that's how we're always preaching, you know, go the speed limit or lower. But, you know, having that 
advantage of putting on a helmet goes a far way with saving someone's life. And finally, legislative guidelines, you know, in terms of, you know, currently we're waiting for the impending road safety act, but there's, you know, lots of information there in terms of the guidelines for provisional motorcycle license. Some of the things that they will, will be able to and, not will, and will not be able to do once they have that provisional license, that graduated kind of system. So, you know, we're looking forward to see what, what can happen with some of the recommendations that are already in play. And, you know, we hope that we are able to really make an impact because we don't have a choice at this point. If we even want to try and break even in terms of fatalities, we're going to have to really make a dent in motorcycle fatalities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Sinclair. Thank you for that presentation. Um, the facts are just right in front of us and I think if anyone chooses to pay attention, we realize that we are in a crisis here and we need to do everything in our power to try to avert it. Um, next on our agenda is Mr. Kenyut here, Director of the Island Chapter Authority, who will be speaking on motorcycle impairment and safety measures. Um, Mr. Here. Mr. Here. Calling can you hear? Yes, oh my mic was on mute. Uh, Zoom, get trying to get used to Zoom and all of these things. But um, I believe that our category of motorcyclists who have been the most skilled road users since 2015 um, is a group that really needs a lot of attention and a lot of help. And just to say that we at the Island Traffic Authority are fully committed to assisting motorcyclists. And that is why we support the motorcycle outreach program that the National Road Safety Council and stakeholders have in place, especially targeting the Western section of the country, because that is where you have a lot of the problems in terms of motorcyclists, fatalities, deaths and injuries. And therefore, one, what has to happen is that um, there has to be continuous dialogue in with them, continuous empowering of the motorcyclists in these regions. Um, you, what you find is that from your St. James leg to St. Elizabeth, that's the epicenter of motorcyclist fatalities. And we must remember that there, since 2015, globally, motorcyclist fatalities overtook pedestrian fatalities. And since that period, the globe, the globe has been overrun by this phenomenon of motorcyclist fatalities in the developing countries. We at the Island Traffic Authority, um, we, we want to, to see motorcyclists being certified fit to operate the motorbike. And that is why we support the program that the police is doing to empower them. Um, more has to be done and more will be done. And um, we are fully pleased to, to join partnerships. But what I want motorcyclists to critically understand is that it's very important for us to understand that that's one of the most dangerous motor vehicles anyone could ever operate. It has two wheels. It doesn't have a cage to protect you in case of a collision. And that is why you must wear protective clothing. You need to wear the helmet, the proper helmet, not the chimney helmet, but the helmet that covered the entire head, especially the first head. Oh, this is the first head. So you need a helmet to cover the first head. And we need to tie on the chin strap, right? Don't catch the helmet on the head because that can be perilous. 
um, because you want to at least give yourself a fighting chance to survive the collision. Also, protective padding, that's very critical. The, the, the slippers riding and the shorts riding thing just won't work at all, right? Another thing that motorcyclists, you want motorcyclists to desist from doing, stop removing the silencer from out of the muffler. In another 20, 30, 40 years, if you continue to do that, you're gonna face um, something that is going to happen. The ear drums are going to come under serious pressure. And remember, when we enter this world, we never enter with spare parts. You can get, there are no spare organs anywhere, right? You can get a spare tire, yes, and those things, but you can't get a spare ribs, a spare head, right? Now it's very critical and very important that motorcyclists keep the mirrors on the bike. Those two mirrors, what if somebody get out of control behind you? Will you be able to see behind you? No, I don't think so. I don't think so, right? So it's very critical and crucial that we make that concerted effort to be safe. And remember that we have families. Most of the motors, all the motorcyclists kill our meals. A lot of them are breadwinners and we are dying leaving our children before our time. Right, and the, the, the data would reveal that um, a lot of it has to do with human factors. And as presented earlier, there are other factors still, but the environment and factors do play a role. But predominantly, it's the behavior of the motorcycles that need to be critically addressed. And uh, I think all stakeholders are fully committed to doing that. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Here, for your input, for your presentation. You're always very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move right along to Mrs. Paula Fletcher, the Executive Director of the National Road Safety Council. Ms. Fletcher will be addressing the issues, the high standards, for, the right standards for motorcycles. Um, Mrs. Fletcher? Do you want to get paid first? Yes, good afternoon all. I had sent your presentation. I don't know if, oh, here it is. And I'm able to operate it. Oh no, this is it. This is the ad though. Okay. Which one would you prefer I start with? Okay, let's play, let's play the ads then. Um, you can go ahead, they don't last very long. These are the two ads that we have for our campaign. No sound. And meanwhile, you're doing this, Mrs. Hudson, Sinclair, I also sent you the actual presentation, but if you don't have it, it's okay. I can just speak to it. Cause I think I'm only seeing the, um, the ads, but no sound. My big soldier for stop the bad driving and speeding on the motorcycle. See they now, him crash and dead left him pitney them. But beg him wear long pants, proper shoes, jacket for protect him entire body. As the helmet, him said nobody now go see him. Well, who are go see him now six foot deep? Motorcyclists, obey road rules. Wear your helmet, the pillion rider too. You must obtain a driver's license and insure and license your bike. This is the law. A message brought to you by the National Road Safety Council, the Ministry of National Security Live Good Program and the National Health Fund. We just had dead half so he. This half is stop. I hear that thing for a broke up and a dead per motorbike. 
Oh, go mind my queen and my pitney when me jump out before my time. Me now left my yard empty for no man step in and take over. Me I go wear me helmet, stop speed, legal up myself, and get my license to drive the bike ya. Yeah. I'll register and insure it too. Me I go be a safe biker. Because my life matters. Motorcyclists, obey road rules. Wear your helmet, the pillion rider too. You must obtain a driver's license and insure and license your bike. This is the law. A message brought to you by the National Road Safety Council, the Ministry of National Security Live Good Program, and the National Health Fund. Okay, thank you all very much. Two ads there from two different perspectives. The perspective of the the female who is concerned about the children of our father losing his life and the fact that he doesn't want to, to, to wear his helmet because he feels he won't be seen. And also the perspective of a biker himself taking on the, 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 the teaching and all the public education to say, I'm going to wear my helmet. And we saw him fastening it under his chin, um, the pillion had on. And then we also saw him properly dressed in long pants and gear a thick jacket and proper shoes so those are the ads that we have airing and we're happy for any one of the um our stakeholders here or partners here to air it on their um and place it on their their various websites and social media sites all right do we also have the presentation update or am, am i might just go ahead because i had sent that too just since morning though, so I don't know if you have seen You that. may have to go ahead. Okay, no problem. All right, so thank you all. Um, most of you here would know me as the Executive Director of the National Road Safety Council, so that information is mainly for others who may be listening in. So we found ourselves in, in 2019, the statistics have already been, been mentioned by um, Mrs. Sinclair, Mrs. Hudson Sinclair, and uh, this phenomenon with motorcyclists overtaking pedestrian fatalities really occurred in 2015 uh, when we had 111 motorcyclists dying. And uh, that trend continued. So in 2019, I was asked on a radio program, you know, what is what is happening? All this work we're hearing about going on in, in, you know, to promote road safety, yet still the figures are still going up. And it was acknowledged that it was the motorcyclists that were dying. And so I decided, I mentioned to my vice chairman, Dr. Lucien Jones, that we have to put it, a uh, call to action um, to our chairman, the prime minister to say, this is a problem. These are the fixes. Where can you, where can the country afford to start? Uh, because I mentioned in a presentation, um, even though I, I got we got cut off um, earlier on your the former lunchtime chat, that we get them the level of safety, or may have been in the road council meeting on Thursday. We get the level of safety that we invest in. Okay, so let me give the example again. We it, it takes a million dollars. Uh, for instance, to get us to the level where we have less fatalities, get us towards zero using the safe systems approach. And we only spend 600,000. Well, people die within that 400,000 gap. So when we talk about what we're all doing and why things can't happen, well, this is the why. Um, because the developing, the developed countries have a different picture to us because of the level of investment they make in road safety. So I'm not saying we should relax and not do anything, but this is a perspective that we need to put to the leaders of our land to let them know that this is going to be the situation until we totally engage the safe systems approach. So in 2019, we, after a meeting at the, at the level of the full council, we came up with a call to action, which was presented to the prime minister on the 15th of April, 2019. Um, it was pretty convincing because he, the Prime Minister agreed for us to go ahead. Um, uh, the, there was agreement with the recommendations and the 
permanent secretary of the ministry, then permanent secretary of the Ministry of National Security. Um, Dan McIntosh was um, commissioned by the prime minister to head a committee. The other players um, in that committee that are the, the, in addition to Minister of National Security, the council, of course, the constabulary force, HART, NTA, the Bureau of Standards Limited, the Road Safety Unit, ITA, um, the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, and the Ministry of Education and Youth. So all us, um, all the players coming together. There were actually 10 work packages that were put together. I won't go through all of them, but one of them was to engage a training program for motorcyclists. Um, there was also to be certification of certification standards for bikers set up, um, a zero tolerance plan for motorcyclists failing to wear helmets, um, a certification curriculum, which is key, um, and motorcycle uh, assembly standards, and also to develop and install motorcycle simulators at agreed locations and to train trainers. So those were some of the the work streams in, in, the, in the package that was developed. Now, what has moved tremendously is, the, is actually the training program um, funded by the Ministry of National Security with $15 million under the Live Good program. Um, this entails us going out to the areas identified, you know, it's the West, that we have to tackle when it comes to motorbike fatalities. So we started out um, at Petersfield. And the idea behind the program is that we have to the sensitize bikers on safe road use, helmet safety, use of protective gear, very important as you saw in that ad just now, road signs and symbols, basic requirements for motorcycle drivers licensing, um, basics of the road code and the practical part um, of in the yard where they would do maneuverability tests. And to top it off, it was a handout of, uh, of helmets to all participating uh, motorbikers. Two helmets, one for themselves and one for the pillion. And we were very scientific about that as best we could because we ensured that the head, their head was measured. It's a two day training program, usually two Sundays consecutively. And the first day they come, they, their head is measured, the circumference, so that the proper fitting helmet can be given to them. And then normally we say, what other size you would, would you like for the second one? So, that is what we have been doing, um, going out. And we did it from August the 9th up to March the 7th. COVID put a stop to that, but thankfully we got through seven cohorts. We went um, to Petersfield three times and actually a simulator was installed there by the Ministry of National Security and as well at Grange Hill. And um, there is a, actually a training facility, two repurposed um, containers that where the, the, the simulators are installed in them and there is space there for training because that is to be the hub for, for trying to train these motorcyclists in, in the West. So we had three sessions at Petersfield, one at Culloden, one at Grange Hill High School, two at Little London, and the next one is planned um, for Sheffield, Sheffield Primary School for the 4th and the 11th of, of this month. So um, that is basically some of the things that we are on track with under this um, initiative to alleviate motorcycle fatalities. Some of the unfinished activities, um, we need to, to have some rules of engagement with the police. And ACP Mackenzie can perhaps comment a little on this. The, to develop rules of engagement for motorcyclists, because you know it's difficult to apprehend them because even if they slow down, when a police stop, policeman stops them, they 
many times tend to slow down and then ride off. And we don't want any of our policemen or certainly any more to um, be harmed trying to, 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 to apprehend these um, motorcyclists that are bent on disobeying the law. Um, we also have to work with the Ministry of uh, um, Industry and Commerce to attract the import and registration of motorbikes. We, you know, we cannot say definitively how many motorbikes are in the country, where they were made, how they were assembled. And so um, that's another standard we're working on. We're working with the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. They had already started to work on um, standards for motor cars, but we have asked them to add motor bikes as well as it is also a vehicle. So they need to complete and promulgate motorcycle assembly standards because there are some um, assembly locations on the roadsides and sidewalks coming out from people's backyards. And the concern is how, what standards are there, they adhere, um, do they adhere to? We also need to develop the motorcycle import standards. What are the motorbike bikes that are coming into the island? Do they have the right kind of braking system that is recommended um, under the um, UN um, guidelines? We also have to continue to work with HART NSTA to complete motorcycle driving training curriculum. Very important because even though the ITA was always charged with, with testing, certifying motorbikers. They really didn't have the in-house capability to do so. So I know Mr. Mr. Hare is, is on to that and we'll hear some more about that, I'm sure. We also need as an unfinished activity to complete training program and distribution of the remaining FIA helmets and to do a report to FIA, the donors, on how well, they have been accepted and the level of usage and that we're depending on the road safety unit to help us um, to continue to work, work on. Um, just to mention quickly as I close, the key outcomes to date, even though I went to the unfinished activities, but key outcomes to date, 315 motorcyclists have been trained um, and approximately 630 helmets distributed to bikers. There have been no fatalities up to this point. Um, this is a month and a half ago, as far as we know, there were no fatalities among bikers trained since August, 2020. And the police in the area, the area police um, report that they see an increased use of the wearing of helmets by these bikers. Um, there are approximately 150 bikers who have been put on a path to acquire driver's licensing licenses. And we have to do a little more with this because what happens is once they pass the, the yard test, the police will present us with a list, with that the list of those who have passed. And then we hand those to IT so that persons wishing to go from that training program on to being certified to learn to drive a motorcycle, they would at least have that component of the training under their belt. We're also working, and this is actually being spearheaded by Mrs. Dillon of, uh, at Petersfield, where she has put 20 motorbike uh, bike riders through the, a road code training program and reading program. Um, and the idea there is that these 20 would advance also because they already would have passed the yard test. So if they go on now to pass a road code test, then they're, they're on their way to being licensed because this is what we want to be able to show people that being a part of this program could get you to the point where you can have your proudly carry your driver's license. And that would be the rite of passage rather than yearning to be part of a gang um, no crew, no headlight, whatever they, they call these they, themselves, because, you know, males at their age, because normally it's that young age band, um, they want relevance. They want to feel as, as, as if their life is vital. So we're trying to steer them in the direction, not of being on the corner, rolling things in the hand middle, but observing the law, coming to these training sessions and getting licensed. So 
we're happy to say that we're, we're going to restart that and we are depending on all the agencies here to come on come back on board and um we will get that going so that's what's happening in terms of the overall program and the standards that we're trying to pursue thank you Thank you so much for your contribution, Mrs. Fletcher. Um, we know that you've been very dedicated to this cause for a while and we really appreciate that. We appreciate that all that the um, National Road Safety Council is doing to ensure that you know we steer away from the poor, the poor decisions that we make on the roads and just completely revolutionize our culture of road safety. Um, next on our agenda, we have Assistant Commissioner of Police, um, Mr. Gary McKenzie, Commissioner. Good afternoon to you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon to other persons on, on this platform. Right. Let me thank you very much for having the police as being a part of of this particular initiative. Uh, it's a very important one. And the fact that we are discussing motorcyclists today makes it even more significant. Uh, we continue to be challenged by the fact that motorcyclists have been losing their lives at the rate at which they have been losing it. It has been said in the deliberations up to this time, the fact that a motorcyclist has overtaken pedestrians in terms of the highest category of road users that have been killed on our roads. And unfortunately, we continue to see them dying. But even more problematic for us is the fact that the patterns that we are used to seeing the challenges with, with crashes where motorcyclists are concerned have been shifting. And so I really just want to, to say that the, we, we are going to have to do a, a lot to, to really curb the rate at which motorcyclists uh, are, are dying on our roads. In terms of the type of offenses that we see motorcyclists committing, for one, the, the most prevalent one is that they fail to keep to the left of the road. Uh, they seem to prefer in the middle of the road or on the other side of the road, unfortunately. And that is where we have had, um, since the start of this year, at least two crashes where two motorcycles have been involved in the same crash, resulting in, in more than two persons being killed. Um, at one point, I recall two years ago, where there was a, a motorcycle crash involving two motorcycles in Westmoreland, and four persons died from that crash. So um, it really um, shows the, the kind of things we are having. Uh, they overtake him properly. That is another main offense because when persons are driving on motorcycles, they seem not to have the kind of patience uh, that persons who are driving other vehicles have. And it's, it, that is unfortunate because the truth is that motorcyclists are subject to all the road rules in a similar way like other vehicles, but they seem not to, to want to adhere to that. The, the third one that has featured, and this is mostly what we are seeing it in the corporate area, is the disobedience of, of road signs and, and traffic lights. Um, this is a A problem and it has resulted in a lot of crashes. They fail to wear a protective helmet, which is a problem that we have been grappling with. In the police force, we have dedicated special returns in terms of the numbers of, of motorcyclists that are issued traffic tickets for not wearing helmets. 
Unfortunately, um, we have the problem a lot, especially out in the rural areas. We have a large number of motorcyclists who do not have driver's license. Uh, the pers some of them have provisional driver's license. And the main issue with this is that those of them who have provisional driver's license are not trained in any way. I mean, they can just go and acquire these provisional driver's license. Um, we are hoping with the, the, um, the new initiatives or the new policies, um, laws that will come on stream that we will see the problem being rectified. Although we should have probably a greater challenge with them not having, some of them not having it now. The last one I would like to mention is the driving of defective motorcycles. And um, why so is because some of them have removed the mirrors. We have seen where they have removed some of the headlight, the, the lights to include headlights. And this make it even more dangerous because you are now driving a motor vehicle without lights. We have seen in instances where we have seized some of them and checked them that the braking systems are not as what they should be because of lack of proper These are some of the offenses that we are, we are seeing. In terms of the locations where we are recording most of the crashes, so I was speaking about the patterns um, at the commencement of my discourse. And I mentioned that the patterns are shifting because we used to have a lot of these crashes in the western part of the island to include Westmoreland, Hanover, St. James, St. Elizabeth. Uh, Mrs. Fletcher correctly um, spoke about the success of the initiative by the National Road Safety Council in collaboration with other entities to include the police and the kind of success that it has had. And we have seen where in Westmoreland uh, there have been a reduction in the number of motorcyclists that are involved in, in crashes. Um, we still have enough few and we hope that it can change. However, what we are seeing now is that St. Elizabeth, St. James, and the, the corporate era, Kingston and St. Andrew, to include St. Catherine, are seeing some amount of crashes. And this is because uh, what we you find is that whilst in, in the rural areas, we have crashes on the main roads um, and in some instances in the towns, but predominantly along main roads. Uh, in Kingston and St. Andrew, the disobedience of road signs, the absence of patience and proper decorum on our roadways. And um, some of them, of course, are actually driving for profit. Um, meaning that the motorcycles are being used commercially, then we have seen um, the prevalence of more crashes. And unfortunately, we are getting more deaths as a result of that. And so we have um, motorcyclists losing control in terms of the types of crashes. Um, we have seen the prevalence of head-on collisions because they are failing to keep to their left. We are having overtaking collisions. And as I said before, we are having these crossing collisions because they are crossing from one road to another, coming from um, a place not being a road and um, undertaking traffic in some instances. And, and we are having crashes. One of the difficulty or one of the, the sad thing um, it, we are seeing that a large percentage of, of motorcyclists, when they do involve, get involved in accidents or crashes, they, they die, and this is an issue. So we are losing a lot of our young men between the ages of 18 to 29, they're about as a result of crashes involving motorcyclists. I believe that we are at about 79 or 80 
of, of uh, motorcyclists losing their lives so far on the road this year. So we have work to do and um, the police support the initiative of um, that is being done right now and in terms of its training and I we are in discussions to expand those but we have to see some improvements in how um, they behave the motorcycles themselves because in some instances they modify the motorcycles to the extent that it compromises safety and and that is not something that we want to happen for our part as as police officers um of course our core responsibility is to enforce and we should be doing that I, the last check i made we had issued over 800 traffic tickets for failure to wear protective helmets and we have seized um a large number of motorcycles uh, i mean if you travel around the, this police stations in western jamaica you will see that the stations all have motorcycles piled up um the pounds in westmoreland and in hanover they have motorcycles that we have seized <clears throat> sorry the truth is that it is very easy to acquire uh motorcycles <coughs> my pardon and so as we seize them they get them back. But we have to continue to work on the issue. We are not giving up. We have to continue the sensitization, the enforcement, and we hope that we will get some improvement. Thank you. You're not, you're not hearing, please. You're not hearing. Uh, are you hearing me? All clearly, right. clearly, clearly. Thank you for that notification. ASP, ACP Mackenzie, uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Transport and Mining, the Director of Island Traffic Authority and the Road Safety Unit, we'd like, to, and the Council, we'd like to extend our sincerest condolences to the loss of your brother in arms, the officer that lost his life yesterday on the nation's roads. Um, we are, we, we know that any, any loss of life is regrettable, but you know, we cannot even imagine what it's like to, to, to lose another officer, you know, who are protectors in society. and. You know, we truly feel for the loss of the JCF and, you know, we just wanted to extend our condolences to the JCF family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that will be communicated. Hmm. Thank you, Miss Sinclair. Thank you for expressing um, or condolences, condolences on, on all our behalf. Um, thank you, thank you, Assistant Commissioner, um, for your presentation. We were supposed to have a, a final speaker today, which would have been a motorcycle crash survivor. Unfortunately, that person had to um, had a last minute engagement and couldn't join us today after all. So we have come to the end of our session. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who participated today, who gave- uh, Can I say something, please? Oh, yes, please go ahead. Oh, I wanted to also make an input to the RSU uh, quickly. Can I do it? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. 
Okay, I'm assistant to Dixon. I am OIC in charge of the emergency medical service for Jamaica. And I was hoping that the RSU would assist us as we would have done a little survey. West Mullen, we transport on, on, on average 90% of the bike accident. And our survey would have shown that in Negro, we have 100 bikers or taxi. We have another, an average 50 in Sheffield. Negril's part was not accounted for. Mango Hall, Little London, Petersfield, and Grange Hill. These are all the bike taxis in Westmoreland. In Hanover, we have Orange Bay and we have Green Island. And what we would have found out is that this are uh, the amount of bikes that we constantly see moving up. Also, I was hoping, as we would have done a local survey, we are the major importers and sellers of bikes in Westmoreland and our three, three persons, our three shops. And we would have found out that they would have sell most of the bike. Also, most of the bike that are sold are never filled with helmet. So we're hoping that the RSU would have looked on these persons and bring them into the fold so that when they would have sell bike, they encourage the bikers to buy a helmet. Um, also, it would be good if they could come on board with the Jamaica Fire Brigade EMS. As I say, we would have transported more than 90% of the accidents. Oh, we would have done um, a number of survey also. I think Ms. Fletcher would have found that out. We are, you know, the accident that we see sometimes are not the, the, the bike taxis, but uh, other person would have purchased bike. And as the number would have shown, the accident are person like 18 and under. And I think this is where really like the the person who sell import and sell are the three major one in Westmoreland. They could um, educate or uh, have a meeting with them when they when they are selling this person to give them pamphlets, which is what when they come to the fire station, we would have educated them. Um, please buy a helmet. These are some of the stuff. Uh, we do our survey, as I say, because it would have depleted many of our medical supplies. But most of our information are sent straight to the Ministry of Health, Dr. Campbell, which I am representing today. Uh, it would be good if they could bring us on board since most of the survey, we would have passed it on to Ministry of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. If um, I may answer. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Hare. The, the point made by Mr. Dixon, um, there is proposal for the regulations to have a motorcycle be sold as a package deal, right? Where some of these safety gadgets will become the norm. Um, once that is, once we have the regulation, then that should be in place to ensure that the helmet is so with the bike. Because this is something that motorcyclists themselves, we found that out from as far back as 2016, that this is what motorcyclists in particular in the Western section of the country want to see done. Um, as it relates to, I believe strongly that there is benefits in partnership with your division. And I am certain that what you have exposed will be done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Here. Thank you, Mr. Here. I just wanted to relate to, to um, Assistant Superintendent Dixon that uh, we have reached out to the Ministry of Health and they, um, they are to get back to us in terms of the transfer of data, but we welcome the initiative because one, we really wanted to find out as a unit in terms of 
you know, the numbers, what is the cost that, it, you know, what takes place for post-crash care, what is the cost? And, you know, you alluded to some information in regards to the buy taxes, and I'm sure the council and myself will network with you in terms of our outreach program and giving you pamphlets and, you know, flyers in terms of bike, you know, bike motorcycle operations, safety operations. So I look forward to meeting with you and discussing these these topics, especially in terms of our program and getting more persons involved in our training program. Because as um, Ms. Fletcher noted that of the persons we have trained since the start, the council started their initiative with the motorcycle training program, we haven't had any crashes, so, you know, in terms of fatalities. So we would definitely would welcome the partnership and I hope, you know, our outreach and this, this collaboration in terms of transfer of data will be successful. So thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, everyone, for that. Um, I think I think that was actually uh, the discussions we were looking for <laughs> earlier today. Um, so thank you so much, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Hare. Thank you, Mrs. Sinclair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your input today. Um, if there are no other questions or input, um, I would like us to wrap up for today. Um, this is the final in our series for June. I expect that there will be more discussions in the future in the very near future and so we again will extend our invitations to each of you to join and to really just give your input and join in the discussion so once again thank you everyone for joining thank you team for making it possible and do have yourself a wonderful rest of day and be safe out there thank you Thank you.